Thank you very much, sir, for uh, being here with us today. On this occasion of the launch of the International Center for Human Development, we have the honor of having with us Professor Amartya Sen, Lord Meghnath Desai, Union Minister for Rural Development, Mr. Jai Ram Ramesh, our Regional Director and for Asia and Pacific and Assistant Secretary General, Mr. Ajay Chibba, and Professor Peter D'Souza, who is the Director of the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, which is our partner institution on this initiative. May I now request Dr. Ajay Chibur, Assistant Secretary General and Director of the Regional Bureau for Asia and Pacific to make his welcome opening remarks. Thank you very much, Sita. Good evening, everybody. Good afternoon and very warm welcome to all of you to this launch of the International Center for Human Development. It's an idea whose time has come. As they say, if you drive on Indian roads, they say better late than never. This was an idea in germination for some time, but its time has come. And we are very honored and very fortunate that we have such a distinguished panel with us today that clearly needs no introduction. Professor Amartya Sen, we are very, very grateful for your long association, of course, with UNDP, but for really honoring us today at the opening of this international center. Professor Sen, I think he has won so many awards, the Nobel Prize, the Bharat Ratna, and many others. But I think if there's one thing that he stands for is human development. We could call him Mr. Human Development. We are also very fortunate that he chose to associate himself with UNDP in developing the ideas on human development with uh, Mahbubul Haq, the late Mahbubul Haq from Pakistan and UNDP of course benefited immensely from that partnership. And Lord Desai, I just found out, was also a perpetrator, if you like, in that endeavor in developing the Human Development Index. And so we'll hear more about that later today as well. For his lecture today, Professor Sen will talk about, actually I'm not sure how it will go, but at least on the program he will talk about human development in the post-2015 era. But of course, like on many other subjects, he, he has always been well ahead of his time. And I found something he wrote in 1994 with Sudhir Anand, where he said, we cannot abuse and plunder our common stock of natural assets and resources, leaving the future generations unable to enjoy the opportunities we take for granted today. We cannot use up or contaminate our environment as we wish, violating the rights and the interests of the future generations. So, as we look at all these discussions that are going on on the post-2015 agenda, the Secretary General of the United Nations has established a very high-level panel as well to work on it. This issue of sustainability is clearly very much on everybody's mind. And Professor Sen was, as you can see from the quote, already some 20 years, at least 20 years ahead of us 
in his thinking on that subject. And the other issue, peace and security, is also a subject on which he has written so much about. Don't have the time to really go into all of that today, but it's, it's, it's another topic on which he has linked the whole issue of human security to human development. And the word protective security, I think, is the word that he has used in some of his writings. So we are very fortunate we have him today. And we have um, Lord Desai as well, who will tell us, I hope, of his um, you know, long association with Professor Sen, but also particularly on the issue of human development. And we are also very grateful to the government of India for the partnership with UNDP in establishing this International Center for Human Development in India, in hosting this center. And today, we have, of course, the distinguished Minister for Rural Development, Jairam Ramesh, with us. In many ways, he has been, um, of course, a major a consumer of human development reports of UNDP, but also I think his life's work in many ways embodies the spirit of human development. I still remember we were at a forum together a few months back where somebody juxtaposed the environmental issues and climate change issues as, de as developed country issues and poverty as developing country issues. And he very rightly said, but climate change hurts the poor the most. So his thinking on sustainability, poverty, human development is, is very, very advanced. And he has led India and, I would say, thinking around the world in bringing these two issues uh, together. So we are very fortunate to have him here with us today. I do want to pay a special thanks to uh, the former Minister of Human Resource Development, Minister Kapil Sibyl, because it is he who, when we proposed this idea of having the Center for Human Development in India, immediately saw how, um, how, how, how good an idea it would be for India to have this center, but also to have this as a place from which uh, India's ideas could also be transmitted all around the world. I also met, along with Liz Grande, the uh, UN resident coordinator, the current Minister of Human Resource Development, Palamaraju, and he could not be with us today, but he very much uh, supports this idea. And so we are very grateful to them as well for um, allowing us to host the center in India and for making this such a great partnership with India. Finally, let me also give a very special thank to the Institute for Advanced Studies because we are doing this in partnership with the Indian Institute for Advanced Studies. And uh, I must, uh, you know, thank um, uh, Mr. Gandhi, the chairman of the board, and also Peter D'Souza, who's with us here today, uh, for allowing us this partnership and um, bringing these two ideas together, the Insti International Center for Human Development and the Institute for advanced studies. We hope that this institute will be both a generator of ideas on human development, um, a disseminator of ideas on human development. And so I think our partnership with the Institute of Advanced Studies will really be very helpful in making that happen. And having gone to school in Simla, I can say that the wonderful facilities of the IIAS in Simla would be very welcome to all those trainees who will come to learn about human development in India. I, for one, would be quite happy to 
come up there and spend some time with you, um, Dr. D'Souza. So um, it is, um, it is uh, an idea, as I said, whose time has come. We hope that this International Center for Human Development will be a place where, as Professor Sen has written, the argumentativeness of India will come out, but we will be very much focused on issues around human development and sustainable human development. We hope for these churning of ideas, a sort of manthan, if you like, on human development that the International Center for Human Development will be able to generate. And we hope, of course, that Professor Sen will associate himself with this center for many years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for uh, your very kind welcome remarks. I must also thank you for being with us here today, coming all the way from New York. And it is your vision that has actually helped to conceptualize and actualize this center. May I now request uh, UN Resident Coordinator and UNDP Resident Representative, Ms. Liz Grant, to uh, release the logo of the International Center for Human Development. Friends, the logo has a universality that is quite special and central to the concept of human development. It combines the colors of the primary elements of life, brown of the earth, blue of water and sky, orange of fire, and the green of forests. It also represents the colors of the Indian flag and the UN, the two primary institutions that have come together to collaborate on this center. The globe represents the global footprint that the center aspires for. The core people-centeredness of human development is denoted by the images of the people at the center of the globe. Thank you, Liz, for releasing the logo. Now, it is my honor and privilege to ask Professor Amartya Sen, Nobel Laureate, who does not need an introduction to this audience, who is a founder, along with Dr. Mehbu Bulhak, of the human development concept and approach. It is only befitting that the inaugural lecture for the International Center for Human Development is being delivered by him. Professor Sen's vision and pioneering work have been responsible for reminding us of the centrality of people's choices and freedoms, even as we pursue the path of faster economic growth. His message is even more relevant at the current juncture when the world is facing the challenges of fiscal crisis, social unrest, and faltering progress on key human development indicators. His vision for a post-2015 era, the terminal year of the Millennium Development Goals, is what all of us are waiting to hear. Professor Sen, sir, may I call upon you to kindly deliver the inaugural lecture for the International Center for Human Development on the important topic of human development in the post-2015 era. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a big hand, please. Well, it's a great delight for me to be here, and I thank you all for coming on this occasion. Um, the title, Human Development in the Post-2015 Era, was, I think, chosen rather rapidly between uh, Liz Grand and myself when we were looking for a title. I think they, they, for those who are wondering what exactly is 2015, well, it's the end of the the, uh, the period in which the Millennium Development Goals were to be finished and the question of what, what to do after that. 
Now here I must say I've always had a bit of a grumble about the million development goals, not because I don't approve of them, and indeed I do, um, but because it was the successor to something called the Millennium Declaration, which preceded it. And that had an enormously bigger role. It had uh, democracy, it had human rights, many other things. So anything that wasn't immediately measurable was dispensed with in the Millennium Development Goals. And there was a victory of the concreteness over foundational concerns. So it's unfortunate, and I've had an opportunity speaking at the General Assembly in, in uh, last fall and trying to urge that they restitute that, and when it's renewed, they go into that. However, what I'm going to talk about today uh, actually fits in quite well with the Millennium Development Goal. That is a, the, the, the rather narrower concern. But I remind that because quite a lot of it would be concerned with some issues where one of the um, major uh, concerns and achievements of India, namely running a multi-party democracy system, would not figure. Uh, and that's certainly one of our achievements. I would be contrasting China with India. And if there are positive things, indeed, I wrote something on that in the New York Review, uh, that indeed, when it comes to democracy, there are issues of which we can be proud. Not that it's perfect. There are a lot of things that can, that has indeed gone wrong. But on the other hand, um, taking the rough with the smooth, there are our achievements are definitely quite considerable on, on and maintaining uh, a multi-party, thriving, functioning democracy in a very poor country with uh, many religions, many languages, many regional differences, uh, as well as many other differences of a political, social, and other kind. But I would be concerned primarily with um, human development, and here again, uh, I would um, distinguish between human development uh, in the broad sense, which includes all the things that concern us, and Mabu Bulhak, the founder, as Ajay mentioned, and I would go further than Ajay, he was not so much made a contribution, he was the architect of the human development. I helped him, make that helped him, many others helped him, but we would have got nowhere but for Mabu Bulhak's leadership. And uh, I shouldn't give a too long a speech, but I ought to perhaps say one or two things about Mahbub himself on this occasion. I certainly couldn't match, couldn't match the admirable brevity of Liz Grant's presentation, which consisted of unveiling it and then disappearing without a word. But I also would like to take this opportunity of welcoming Liz, because she hadn't been here for very long. And we have um, many other uh, uh, concerns in common, uh, in addition to uh, uh, human development, uh, including uh, our respective friendship with Eric Hobsbawm, the great historian, uh, who was a very close friend of mine, very close friend of Liz, and who died only a little while ago uh, at a very advanced age. Now, um, so uh, welcome, uh, Liz, and I hope uh, you find uh, the work here uh, entertaining, I think entertaining it will be, uh, uh, worthwhile, I hope so, <laughs> and certainly uh, there's a huge role for the UN to play and the UN coordination to play in this context. Um, Mabu introduced me, as it were, or we talked about the idea of human development when I first met him in October of 1953. I had just arrived from Calcutta Presidency College. He had just arrived from Pakistan. We arrived more or less on the same day, and we were walking towards a lecture, I think, of John Robinson. And um, uh, I think Mabu asked me whether I knew where the middle lane was, and I explained that I did. I was very well equipped by then, having spent 24 hours and walked around. And so we walked together, and this became, of course, a close friendship. But I remember spending a lot of time chatting with him already then 
as to why, what even what Mrs. John Dobinson was then teaching us, while very interesting in themselves, isn't really what we are concerned with. And I remember one of Mahbub's remarks then, that if India goes as fast as, um, as is possible, maximum possible, which of course in those days used to be rather lower than it's taken to be now, maximum possible, then in 40 years India and Pakistan would catch up with Egypt. And he said, would that be adequate for us? Now, I would, would like to explain, Mahbub had nothing against Egypt. <laughs> but he was saying that we should be able to do spectacularly better right now and right here. So that was really the thing that drove the human development thing. And he, of course, then I stayed on for a while in Cambridge. He went to, to Pakistan. He went first to Yale, and then he went to Pakistan. And I visited him before I joined in Delhi School of Economics in the 60s. I came via uh, Lahore and, uh, and um, Karachi. And he was still concerned with it. And then, of course, bit by bit, he was exercising more power in Pakistan, but also getting more and more dissolution. And then in 1989, I, in the summer, he called me and he said, drop everything, you have to come and help me out with the, doing the human development approach. Not just human development index, that's only one part of it to which you made a reference, uh, Ajay. And that's right, that is in fact the flagship. But in fact, the approach is much broader than that because it uh, concerns all the things that human life as flourishing depends on. So we, uh, uh, and I said, look, I can't drop everything. I've got PhD students, I've come teaching, I've got a job, I've got a salary, and so on. But eventually, as always, my book, of course, prevailed. So I found myself going very regularly through 89, 90, when the first human development report appeared in, in the summer of um, uh, um, 1990. I thought the human development index, I have to acknowledge, uh, I had a huge role in, uh, in, in, in making. Indeed, it could be said that in many ways I put the touches that made it possible. We knew what factors, to, after some argument, what factors to put together. There was a question of indexing. Mabu did not want any indexing. Uh, you know, he didn't want any weighting. Only one, one, one. And so I extend. Uh, Mabu never liked formal reasoning much. Uh, but he didn't need it because he had enormous insight in everything. So I said, look, these are three different units. So one, one, one is no more arbitrary than one, two, four, or anything else. So anyway, then we uh, got our sites together, and then we did rather interesting sensitivity analysis, changing the weights, looking at the numbers, and see how they come up. And to combine plausibility in terms of other information, along with this, to arrive at the weighting. And then that, as those who would know mathematical economics would know, is done by normalization. That is, if you take the life expectancy, the bottom to be zero and top to be 100, then it gets a, each year gets a weight of one. But if you take the bottom to be the lowest at that time, let's say 50 or something, or 45, and the highest to be Japan in 85, then, of course, each year, get a much bigger weight. So that's the, uh, so the normalization had to deal with that. Anyway, the HDI came through. The, uh, I was opposed to it. I told my book that it was vulgar to try to get one number. And, uh, and my book at one stage told me, I mean, he kept calling me. I was then in, uh, in, in Harvard. And then my son, Kabir, came up and told me that that man is on the phone again. <laughs> and that man told me, uh, you're right, quite right, uh, Amartya. Uh, it is vulgar. I want you to work on an index which is just as vulgar as GDP, excepting represent something of human life. And I think that drove the HDI. And then, of course, he had a real delight when it caught the headline everywhere, uh, kind of places where we didn't expect headlines, like Financial Times, The Economist, and so on. Um, and then, of course, the human development approach prevailed and became the most widely used uh, approach. Indeed, the HEI became the most widely used index for a while, for a long while. Now, <coughs> if you look at that, what, what's the content 
of the human development, what, what does it depend on? Well, I, there are two distinctions here to make. One is growth and development, and the other is development and human development. Now, the growth and development is an issue. Growth is about GDP, or GNP. Thank you, Adia. And um, it's not about human beings as such. It's about commodities. So development translates that into things connected with human life. Now, all development economics, even to start with, had been that. There was a certain amount of confusion at the beginning of development economics, like Arthur Lewis and so on. But on the other hand, even though he talked about growth, it's quite clear if you read the book carefully, he was really concerned with human uh, living. Not very clearly, but I think he was. Um, but the people like Albert Hirschman, another person who have lost only last two months ago, uh, was very clear on that. And, and so were uh, people writing in, in this country and in, and in other developing countries in the world. Now, human development puts them together in a kind of coherent whole. And the two ways the problematic differs is not that every kind of change of human life is, is a celebration, of course that is, but more than that, it tries to do a certain amount of evaluation of how important is this, how important is that. So here human, human beings come in in terms of also our evaluative faculties. There's no way of escaping that. And when people say, well, GDP is great, you don't have to make any value judgment. What it means is that you're accepting the value judgment that the market makes for you. Whereas human development is saying that you make it yourself. Explain to me why is life expectancy this important? Why is female education that important? And so forth. So it converts a mechanical exercise into a cognitive and evaluative exercise. And it also addresses the difficult issue of how development and growth are related. Now here's a point to note that human development has got nothing, to, nothing against economic growth whatsoever. In fact, of the three indicators that make up the HDI, one of them is, in fact, GDP per capita, up to a certain level. Beyond that, we don't worry about that. All that was, in fact, entirely aimed at developing countries, though it was used quite a bit to make comparison within Europe. Mavu was extremely pleased, and he called me up when he said that the Canadian Prime Minister had made an election statement saying he couldn't understand how the opposition can expect to get any vote at all, given the fact that Canada was at the top of the HDI League. And Mavu summarized this observation by saying, clearly, we have won. So I think that was a kind of visibility of a result that he's looking at. But he was also pointing to the fact that the kind of weighting that has emerged in the human development approach is getting more and more accepted. On the other hand, human development may, may be extremely um, keen on economic growth. I've been writing most things, uh, mostly what I've been writing on on practical matters, leaving out field theory research last year, has been about Europe. And the catastrophic error that Europe made in selling growth down the drain, overlooking the fact that you cannot pay back the debt without a high growth economy. I mean, high growth generates resources. The question, in India, the question is, how are we using the resources? What purpose? In what kind of advancement of human life? When we cannot um, uh, justify that, there is a failure of a human development engagement. But when you're not generating any growth at all, and just asking people to cut this and cut that, which Europe has gone on again and again, and not got anywhere, as indeed would have been predicted, even on Keynesian reasoning, but there are many other reasoning, including that of Adam Smith, uh, as to why you have to take a broader view of, of, of human society and development to understand the engagements involved. Contrary to uh, Smith's image as a no-nonsense marketeer, of course, he was always a great believer in state's role in developing in those things uh, that the state can do. Indeed, he said, the reason why we need 
good political economy is because it helps to generate um, uh, development by which he meant uh, growth of a kind that would improve the life of human beings and also generate resources for the government to spend those things which only the public sector can uh, can can uh, can do, and I quoted that, of course, also in my lecturing to Europe. So I think that that was a context in which the neglect of growth is perhaps the biggest failure of human development. So the idea that there is a kind of contradiction between them is quite ridiculous. It is, you know, it only point that that Mabu was making is that growth is not valuable on its own. When it's essential and needed, then to slacken on it would be a very bad pursuit of human development, and when it's not in essential, uh, but uh, when it's absolutely only thing you're doing and not using the resources for any other purpose that enhances human life, well then it's a different kind of criticism. I think Europe has gone into that, and I have to say to the credit of India, it actually did not fall for that. India did not, China didn't. Um, Britain, which was not part of the Euro and did not have any reason to pursue that, nevertheless pursued it. It's never been quite clear why they chose the painful part of cutting everything, especially since John Maynard Keynes was actually born in Eng England, uh, that, that that would somehow generate uh, a, a budget surplus, uh, which of course it didn't generate as predicted, and they continue to believe it will now. It hasn't in two years, but now it will. Uh, this is the greatest folly of all, of which actually Adam Smith also speaks, namely inability to learn from experience and expect that even though everything is much the same as in the past, it will now generate a different result, which it hasn't, of course. I won't go indulge in anti-English uh, um, uh, statements of people like George Bernard Shaw, uh, in Man and Superman, when I think Anne Tanner says that an Englishman feels moral only when he is merely uncomfortable. Uh, and I think, that, I think that's probably a psychologically unfair statement to make. Uh, on the other hand, it's not easy to find an explanation. It's certainly not easy to find an explanation within economics of what has been going on. Now, in terms of the situation in India what, uh, and, and in, the, in the developing world, what's been happening. India has had high rates of growth. It is uh, weakened a bit. Uh, but, you know, we have to put that in perspective. I think in, in, uh, in last week of June, last year, I got two phone calls one morning. One was from a French paper asking me that, have you seen the last quarter Eurozone figure, and I said, no, I haven't. What's happened? He said, it stopped shrinking. The Eurozone had zero growth rate. Is it not a moment for congratulation? I said, well, it probably is. Let me think about that. He said, could you give an interview? I said, well, it depends. I have to fit it in. Two hours later, I got a call from a television thing channel here, in fact, NDTV, saying, what have I got to say about the disastrous figure on economic growth? Dismal figure. So I said, how dismal is dismal? And they said, oh, really dismal. It's 6.2% growth rate. <laughs> so I had to take the two remarks together and wondered which interview I ought to give. In the event, I think I don't give either. I think I may have answered a couple of questions of NDTV. But the, the issue here is to understand the role of growth. And I think the, uh, the, you know, there's no question that to raise the rate of growth in India would be a good thing, absolutely. And there are ways of doing it. And indeed, the government can do it, and indeed, the public can do it too, to help in that. This is a big project. On the other hand, it's also very important to see, A, how growth is generated, and B, what is done by the resources generated by economic growth. Now, I began by saying my praise of India with China, let me give you some numbers which now would indicate the other side of the story. China has been growing a bit faster than India. A lot of people think that India should try to catch up with China, which I must say 
I do want India to catch up with China, but not just growth rate, but on the quality of life and other things. On the other hand, the idea that in order to do that is not to buy cutting on welfare payments and, and the pursuit of capa human capability formation, not only is a mistake, it completely confuses the entire lesson of Asian development, beginning with Japan in the, in the in mid 19th century, namely education, healthcare, and expanding productivity of human beings, not only helps human life, which is the primary uh, impact, but it also makes economic growth possible and easier. And China went in that direction, went for universal education straight away, went for universal health coverage, though of not a very good kind initially, even before economic reforms. And it, over the years, there have been ups and downs after the economic reforms. There was a period of some confusion, but the growth has continued, and India has, uh, China has continued to grow faster than India. On the other hand, this has not been the case that this has been achieved by not doing human capability exactly the opposite. Undernourishment, child undernourishment in India, looking wait for age, 43.5% of our children are undernourished. The percentage in China, as opposed to 43.4, is 4%, four and a half. The life expectancy, of course, is China is higher, 673 rather than 65. Under five mortality, under five mortality, a bad thing, in India is 63, in China it's 18. I think in, in, in almost anything you look at, there's a major difference. Now, the difference is partly the engagement with these services in, in the nature of economic um, in the uh, nature of economic policy making. India spent 1.2% of the GDP on public health care. China spends 2.7%, more than twice as much, on governmental health care. A lot of people who are under the impression that our prematurely privatized health care is based on China, not at all. Whatever private health care comes, as in Kerala, comes on the basis of a secure foundation of a public health expenditure that puts health services within easy distance from anywhere. So you, if you see that, and I can give the figures for education for our, all other areas, Jean Dwez and I are finishing a book now on India, which will be published in July, which where we go into all these comparisons within India as well as India and other countries. Um, and the picture is quite sharp. The, if you look at just economic inequality, you'll be somewhat misled because of the fact that the Chinese and Indian economic inequality are not very different in terms of income distribution. It used to be thought that India was much lower, but that isn't quite right, because we compared our expenditure, family expenditure inequality with income inequality. Expenditure inequality is well known by any economist who has worked on these empirical things. is always standardly lower than income inequality. But now that we do have income inequality figures, they are roughly the same. On the other hand, the differences are dramatic. Beginning with the most elementary, 48% of the Indian families do not have toilets. This is put sometimes rather in an arcane way, saying they practice open defecation. But it isn't the cult that made them practice open defecation. It's not a thought to be a great merit in itself. And indeed, uh, as my colleague Ron Dres was telling me that, and I was changing their language, and I said, look, how do you know that? He said, oh, because they have no toilet. Therefore, the figure really is toilet. 48%, nearly half the population don't have any toilet. India's undernourishment of children, I've already commented on, is dramatically higher, not only in absolute numbers, despite the fact that China has a larger population, but as a proportion, incomparably different. There's hardly any population which doesn't have 
a public health care availability, public education facility within reach. It's the lack of the basic amenities of life which make the Indian inequality so extraordinary. It's not the story of the rich and the super rich and the tycoon. But that's a different part of the story, whether you can collect more income from them or not. That's not what angers people, what angers people and anger that's suppressed because the media is not very friendly to such issues as toilet absent and in, in a way that much more dramatic issues come into the story a lot more. Uh, it's certainly big um, uh, to talk about the urban deprivation, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, when, when we had a catastrophic organizational failure, and that certainly needs fixing because the Indian public sector requires accountability in a way it doesn't have, and in the infrastructure, physical, not just social, but both requires building. But we have to put them in proportion. The headline said 600 million people plunged in darkness. Well, that's true. But 200 million of them never had any electricity connection anyway. And the country still debates about how it's people friendly to have cheaper electricity while one third of the people have nothing to do with electricity. Similarly, cooking gas and so on. These are very easy issues to, to um, capitalize on. And on the other hand, the other kind of real deprivation, and you know, I'm absolutely delighted that at long last the issue of violence against women is receiving that kind of attention it has. It, it absolutely. But I would have been even more delighted if it was recognized that Dalit women have been undergoing real violence over a very long time with hardly any protest and any organization behind it. I think there is an absolute uh, gulf in, 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 in that picture. So I think we ought to uh, uh, really look at human development for what it is. Um, it, which includes the important contribution of growth. It also points out how growth is achieved, whether to human capability expansion or not, makes a difference. To recognize that human capability expansion is the Asian model of development. To recognize that it's within our powers to, to make a big change in that. From time to time, the question has been raised when I and sometimes people say I talked about the Kerala model. I never to uh, <laughs> defy anyone to find a single statement of mine where I quoted Kerala model. I did say there is a lot to learn from Kerala, but in those days I thought Kerala had a lot of bad lessons to offer as well. Uh, and, and you have to take a much more um, uh, positive, uh, constructive policy about the market along with the, all the things they were doing. But the total result of it, of course, I was told that this was a flash in the pan. But of course, Kerala's growth rate from being a very low-income country state is now one among the very top. And so are the other, other st states which follow routes like that. Tamil Nadu is one example. Himachal is another example. And of course, their achievement, Himachal has been one of the poorer states. But uh, it has, it's the fact that it overtakes others a lot to do with the Asian model of development, namely the capability-based expansion. Sometimes the comparison is made with uh, Gujarat, which of course had a very distinguished record of, um, of uh, doing physical infrastructure well. And from there, there is a lot to learn, undoubtedly. At the same time, if you look at the total result, then you have to see that a lack of interest in human development could make a difference and made even the difference on per capita income. If you look not just the average income, but the median per capita income, in Gujarat is 6,300, in Tamil Nadu 7,000, Himachal Pradesh 9,942, and Kerala 9,987. If you look at the percentage uh, of the below poverty line, 2004-05 scale, in Gujarat is 31.6, 
Tamil Nadu 29.4, Himachal Pradesh 22.9, Kerala 19.6, all in the income index. But then, but this is not unconnected with the human development, which had been feeding the process. And then if you look at, uh, say, female literacy, Gujarat 63.8, Tamil Nadu 69.4, Himachal 69.5, Kerala 93.0. If you look at the percentage of child um, um, undernourishment, you find similarly uh, a higher picture. And, and also under five mortality, uh, that number is, is quite striking. Gujarat 60.9 under five mortality, as opposed to 60.9, Tamil Nadu 35.5, Himachal 41.5, Kerala 16.3. If you look at present-day effort immunization, 45.2% of the population of Gujarat is fully immunized, only 45. In Tamil Nadu, 80.9, Himachal 74.3, Kerala 75.3. So I think the, the picture is this, that there is really no conflict between high growth and human development, because human development is not only good in itself, it's one way of achieving growth. And despite the fact that China lacks the kind of multi-party democratic uh, approach that we happen to have, there has been sufficient concern with the lives of the underdogs of society in China um, to make a picture of a kind that puts India quite a bit to shame. Not always. I've also written about the Chinese famine. Recently, I've been corrected by a recently published book which said when I estimated that there were 29.6 million people dead in the Chinese famine, they said that I underestimated it. Originally, I was told that I was invented the famine. The first four letters in the New York Review after my article all claimed that had there been such a famine, would we have not known? Uh, of course, the fact is that if you the famine could survive only because it's not known and not discussed. Now I'm told that I'm wrong because it's 40 million people who died. With whichever the number, there have been periods of great neglect. So there is no kind of um, um, resilience and, 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 and certainty that things will be fine in an autocratic uh, country when there is, uh, when the democratic system is not functioning. But China, of course, had made a quite a bit of progress in that. I would like it to make more progress. Uh, I, spend, I go to China quite often to find out what's happening. I also chair the uh, International Advisory, um, um, International Adv Advisory Board of the Development Institute of Peking University. And I know that the Indian Chinese intellectuals have been in the forefront of wanting economic reform, not just of the, of, the, of the market kind, but also healthcare, also education, also freedom of speech and, and those issues. So this is the really interesting thing to look at. And I think when the post-2014-15 things come, we have to look at both the Millennium Development Goals, which of course puts China way ahead of India, uh, as well as the Millennium Declaration and including issues about human rights and so on, which we have to look at. And also the question of how we can combine our democratic system with the kind of commitment that the government, uh, that the government of China has been able to produce in pursuing the interests of the very poor. Uh, the, and here, it's often people say, what would you advise the government to do? I don't think it's a question of only advising the government. As a citizen of India, I want to talk to other citizens of India. You know, some of us have maintained the citizens of India, despite a certain amount of inconvenience, standing for two hours at a queue at entering a country, because every country to which I go, they are absolutely convinced I want to settle there. <laughs> and that's the result of having an Indian passport, but I'm very happy to have that. But I would like to speak to other Indian citizens to talk about the fact that it, the, what the government is able to do, one, and B, not just able, what the government is uh, 
politically compelled to do depends on what the opposition party does, what the agitations are. If the agitations are all about cheaper electricity for those who have electricity and advantages of the cooking gas for those who have the cooking gas and, and so on, uh, then I think the issues of half the population not having toilets and, and in India having the highest undernourishment in the world in terms of child undernourishment will not become a politically engaged issue. I had the opportunity in the December of 2011 in the Indian Economic Association, uh, of which I was very proud that I was involved and I was president of it. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, I mentioned that when I became president of the American Economic Association, that I learned some of my tricks, some of the ability to deal with it in the context of Indian Economic Association, and the same would apply to Econometric Society and so on. But the, the fact is that I got an opportunity at that time. I think Montek Singh Alu Ali was the president. He asked me to give a talk, and I did. And I mentioned about all these scandals, and I also pointed out that public resource is a very important thing, but the government had just outlined a plan of food subsidy. And a lot of people said, gosh, this is so fiscally irresponsible. Well, the fact is, the fiscal irresponsibility might be there, but there's so many other items, including a fairly trivial one, no uh, import duty on the import of gold and diamond. That you sacrifice more um, revenue there, even taking into account some of that will be converted into ornaments and sent abroad, even the net figure. And there are several other items like that. Now, uh, it's a question of which one would lead to more agitation. And it was good to do, for the government to try to do that. And I was very pleased when I was told that in the budget, the government had just introduced a tax on gold. But then, of course, immediately there was street protest about that, anti-poverty <laughs> of having, so whether led by jewelers or the user, users of jewelry, the government abandoned it. So it's really what you have to address is not just government policy. You have to address opposition policy, opposition, and also the responsibility that we as citizens ought to take as to what we put as focus in our in our demands for the government, from the opposition, from the media, from the society. And I think that's where the issue of human development, uh, I think of Mabu al he would have been delighted to um, think that, uh, that there is a major role for human development in that context. And I'm, of course, delighted that um, uh, since I was associated with him and had a role as Ajay kindly mentioned in the, in the, in the initiation of it, uh, uh, that um, it remains a very important perspective to look at uh, in India today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sen, for this inspiring uh, address as the noble citation mentions, and I quote, by combining tools from economics and philosophy, he has restored an ethical dimension to the discussion of vital economic problems, unquote. He has precisely done this today and brought to our attention the ethical dimensions of development, highlighted the relationship between economic growth and human development, and, sir, you have exhorted us for long that learning by India, from India, is crucial. You have reiterated once again the importance of learning from other countries, but also from learning from the experiences of our own states in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our privilege today to have with us the Honorable Union Minister for Rural Development, Sri Jairam Ramesh. Sri Ramesh has been a champion of not only the Human Development Report that he is an avid reader of right from the beginning, from 1990, but he actually practices the Human Development Approach. 
who was gracious enough to be a jury member for the Manav Vikas Awards, the first ever Human Development Awards in India, honoring excellence in human development reporting and analysis. He has encouraged us constantly to move from human development analysis to human development action. It is a, a matter of great pleasure for us to invite you to deliver the presidential remarks on the occasion of the launch of a center whose core mandate is to support the move from human development analysis to action. Sri J. Ram Ramesh. <clears throat> Professor Sen, Lord Desai, Dr. Chibba, Dr. D'Souza, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's very presumptuous on my part to offer any comments on what Professor Sen has had to say, but I'm delighted that he has picked on certain themes that do not get the attention they deserve in the public discourse in this country. And I'd like to begin by thanking him for highlighting the centrality of sanitation uh, in the whole debate that we are having on human development. Over 60% of women in India are still defecating in the open. Over 60% of all global open defecations are in India. And today we have robust medical evidence to suggest a direct causal link, not correlation, but a causal link between open defecation and malnutrition. Malnutrition, which is now rightly occupying central stage in our public discourse, in our political discourse, uh, has many dimensions, but what we have not recognized, and I was having a discussion with Lord Desai just before we started, what we have not recognized as yet is the key role played by poor hygiene and open defecation in persistently high levels of malnutrition in this country. And the key to un understanding this puzzle, people like Angus Deaton and Jean Dres have written extensively on this, and they have ended their writings by saying the puzzle of India's persistently high levels of malnutrition. And in my view, one of the keys to this puzzle is open defecation, poor hygiene, and abysmal sanitation. And I think this is something that is crying out for public action. And if Professor Sen particularly adds his very influential voice, I'm sure that in the next decade or so, sanitation will begin to occupy the place that education now occupies. Maybe 20 years ago, education was not part of the political debate. Today it is. And I'm hopeful that 10 years from now, uh, sanitation would, would be in the same category. The second point that he has made, which I'm delighted he has made, uh, is on the importance of health outcomes. Uh, today we have evidence from across the country, and this has been documented extensively by Anirudh Krishna at Duke University, we have evidence across the country that the single most important determinant of vulnerability of communities to poverty is health expenditures. In fact, we have this outdated uh, concept of headcount ratios on which Professor Sen has written extensively. Uh, but really, when you look at poverty and the changing dimensions of poverty in our country, it's health poverty and ecological poverty that is now coming into greater and greater focus. It's the expenditure, it's the private expenditure on health because of the collapse of the public health system in large parts of the country and the degradation of land resources and the uh, drying up of access to water and forests, the traditional sources of livelihood, uh, which is driving people in and out of poverty. It's not that communities are permanently BPL or permanently APL. There's a very large uh, community, very large population that goes in and about this poverty line that we have drawn for ourselves. And that movement across the vulnerability line uh, is caused, A, by health expenditures, uh, and two, by, as I said, ecological poverty manifested in degradation of land and choked off access to water and forest resources. So I'm delighted that he has once again focused on the centrality of health outcomes. And this has enormous implications for the way we tackle poverty. The third aspect that he's talked about again, which I'm extremely happy that he has, he has joined the Kerala versus Gujarat debate uh, very, 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 very frontally. 
and he has a Gujarati sitting next to him and I'm sure the Gujarati sitting next to him will, will talk more about the so-called Gujarat model. And as I was telling him, the Gujarat model is really the Gujarati model. The Kerala model is a public action model. The Gujarat model is a Gujarati model because of the nature of the Gujarati society. Entrepreneurial, commercial, business oriented, growth oriented, no argumentation on arcane points of GDP and poverty ratios, but just getting it done. But the Kerala model, as Professor Sen has written very extensively, uh, is a direct outcome of political action and public action in which a large number of actors, including political parties, trade unions, women's organizations, civil society groups, have participated. As somebody who is uh, a Tabildian by marriage, I'm delighted that he has talked about the Tamil Nadu model. Uh, because there is a Tamil Nadu model that economists don't talk about. They, they juxtapose the Gujarat model and the, and the Kerala model. But actually, in between these two, there are a plethora of models within India. There is the Tamil Nadu model, uh, which is again a model of high growth, high welfare expenditure, but something which is unusual, also superior outcomes on the ground. So Tamil Nadu is an example of not just delivering on growth and delivering on public expenditure, but is also delivering on outcomes. We have the Assam model. Nobody talks about the Assam model over the last decade. If you look at the human development ind indicators, uh, the, the state that has had the, one of the most impressive increases in human development in reduction of the gap is Assam, but nobody talks about the Assam model. We have now in large segments uh, of the sub-economy, not in the macro-economy, but for example in agriculture, we have the Madhya Pradesh model. Whoever thought five years ago that Madhya Pradesh would be the second largest contributor uh, to the central pool of wheat, but today, next year, Madhya Pradesh would probably exceed Haryana in that category. Who would have ever thought that Chhattisgarh would be a major contributor to the central pool of rice, but Chhattisgarh is. So I think the, de the academic debate certainly and the policy debate should not get frozen into these two extreme models, the Kerala model of the one side and the Gujarat model on the other. And there is a large number of successful models within the country uh, coming up in the most uh, unexpected of places. And I think if we keep our eyes open, you will see remarkable successes uh, coming in in many of these areas. I'd like to just make three additional comments to what Professor Sen uh, had, has had to say. First, and this is really derived from his own work and my own observation in the field. First, that superior human development outcomes are possible and have been demonstrated at lower rates of economic growth. And the classic example of this is Bangladesh. If you compare Bangladesh with some of the fast growing Indian states, and I would include Gujarat, Andhra, Karnataka, these are all fast growing Indian states, on five of the most crucial economic indicators related to human development, Bangladesh scores higher at consistently lower rates of economic growth. It's not a coincidence that most of these indicators on which Bangladesh scores higher are related to women's empowerment and sanitation. That's where they score better than many Indian states. So I think we must accept that superior human development is possible even when you have lower rates of economic growth. Second, high economic growth does not necessarily translate into superior human development outcomes. You have Karnataka. I don't want to, do, I don't want to be accused of uh, Gujarat bashing, so I'll take a state in the, southern, in the southern part of the country from which I come from, Karnataka. If you take Karnataka, it is a high growth state, but you have six districts of Karnataka where human development indicators are as bad, if not worse, than sub-Saharan Africa. Something that we don't normally talk or associate with this high economic growth trait. So high economic growth certainly does not necessarily translate into superior human development outcomes. Third, High economic growth is certainly essential for dealing with the scale of the problem that we are confronted. I think that's the centrality of economic growth when we talk about why we need economic growth. It's not just we need economic growth for generating the resources, that's 
common sense, it's 101, but the scale of human development backlog that awaits us in UP, in Bihar, in Odisha, in Jharkhand, uh, in, the, in the central part of the country, necessarily demands public expenditure. And that will necessarily have to come from higher rates of economic growth. So while the first two factoids uh, might call into question the essentiality of uh, economic growth, I think we must recognize, given the scale of the problem that with which we are confronted and the challenges with which we are confronted, uh, there is no escaping the need for high economic growth. And I think this is something that we must accept and we must move forward on. So these are my only three additions to what Professor Sen has said, and much of this is actually derived from the work that Professor Sen uh, and, and others have done. In passing, let me say that um, while Professor Sen is a, is a visitor to India, he has left behind his clone, Jean Dres, uh, and who works very closely with us and who keeps reminding us all the time of the central message that Amartya Sen is not against the market, that Amartya Sen is not against growth, but all he's asking for is a better utilization of the fruits of that economic growth, of the resources that he is uh, generated from economic growth. In fact, it's a peculiar situation now. Amartya Sen, compared to Jean Drez, Amartya Sen is more of a globalizer than Jean Drez now is. Jean Drez is now becoming a bit of a Luddite, and I thought I would never live to see the day where Professor Sen would be hailed as a champion of market economics and faster integration with the world. So Professor Sen, thank you very much and I enjoyed enormously listening to you uh, and I look forward of course to your continuing education. Thank you. Thank you sir for providing further food for thought on the relationship between economic growth and human development and for tirelessly championing the cause of water supply, sanitation, and highlighting the issues of health and ecological poverty. Friends, we are doubly honored today by the presence of Lord Meghnath Desai, who has been a guiding force and part of the core team of Dr. Mehboobul Haq, which translated the concept of human development into measurable indices. Lord Desai made pioneering contributions to the to the measurement of Human Development Index going beyond the traditional indicators and advocating for a political freedom uh, indicators as well as the environmental dimensions long before they became fashionable. We are delighted, sir, that you are able to join uh, this event today. And may I call upon you to please offer your comments. Lord Desai. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Jairam Ramesh, uh, Amartya Sen, friends. Uh, I was very fortunate in, in the words of Dean Acheson, of being present at the creation of human development. And uh, I can only blame Amartya Sen for getting me involved into this, because at one stage after the Latin American debt crisis, the Latin American UNDP approached uh, Amartya Sen to find an alternative uh, to income because at that time IMF was battering down on everybody to follow a very orthodox Washington consensus model in terms of action rate uh, uh, devaluation and balance, by, you know, balance budget and all that, anti-inflation. And Amartya Sen being a very busy man, he said he can't do it, but he'll ask Meghna Desai to do something about it. So I said, yes, I'll do it if you are a consultant to the consultant. Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, we, that didn't really actually get me anywhere. But in the middle, we were uh, hijacked by Mahbubul Haq. Uh, I hadn't realized that what happened in 19, uh, 1989, the seeds of that conspiracy was laid in 1953, when Amartya Sen and Mahbubul first met outside King's College, uh, Cambridge. But then all all the world's problems arise from King's College, Cambridge, in my view. Uh, uh, but anyway, at that, I remember at that very first meeting, Mabu having already announced, already announced that we had found an alternative 
to, uh, you know, uh, to GDP. We had to work frantically hard to find uh, such an alternative. And I think one long afternoon in September 1989, uh, sitting around uh, a long table, uh, not very far from where the UN is, uh, the Human Development uh, Index was constructed, partly based on something Amartya had done in 1981, and partly in on what I was trying to do, and eventually, uh, after some adjustment, and at that time, I have to say, I had always thought that the intellectual origins of human development are both in the crisis of underdevelopment, which was illustrated by the Latin American debt crisis, as well as at that time, if you remember, the severe crisis of, as it were, the alternative socialist model in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. We were very aware, we were all very conscious. We were also aware that at that time in developed countries, there was a big reaction in terms of free market policies. You know, I had myself written about uh, monetarism, a critique of monetarism, but we, you know, and, and in the British context, we were fighting kind of day-to-day -day battle uh, with Thatcherism and so on. And so there were these things going on all the time that you could not say, oh, socialism is better than, than capitalism. I mean, that, that kind of story we could tell in the 1950s was no longer there. The kind of Latin American model of import substitution and initialization was in tatters by then. And so, so we, we, were, we were looking for alternatives. And I think it's very important, I've always believed the human development never ever rejected the market as a possible ingredient in a development model. It never did. Indeed, if you read the first human development report, which I think I would say is, you know, one of the best written UN uh, documents that I know of. Uh, I didn't write it, he did. Uh, so, uh, but it clearly says that markets are important. Growth is important. But it's not everything. Obviously, what we know, there are different kinds of growth. The GDP growth rate is just a number. You know, six percent growth rate can come from very labor intensive growth, creating lots of jobs, or it can come from very capital intensive growth, creating very few uh, jobs. And it will make a lot of difference to human development, which it is. So you can't just have one to one uh, sort of debate about is high growth good for human development. And that kind of argument is silly. Uh, we shouldn't get into it. What is true? is that the translation of growth into human development is a complex process like everything else is, and it will depend upon the kind of growth you have, the kind of regional spread you have, the kind of sectoral spread you have, and so on. I mean, you know, that, that sort of, I, I should, uh, as kind of, uh, I was called recently a non-resident Gujarati, uh, so as a non-resident Gujarati, I have to make a comment on this. I've always held, uh, and kind of independently of this uh, controversy, that India is a collection of many nations and many economies. We call it a single economy, but it's a collection of many economies. Gujarat has been a developed country for about a thousand years. You know, uh, maybe two thousand years, I, I'm sorry to say. Uh, as has been uh, Tamil Nadu. I mean, you go into the history of India, and Tamil Nadu was always an open economy with a lot of trade relations and so on. Gujarat was an open economy with a lot of trade relations. Our, our perspective of history comes from the Delhi Sultanate model of India. We will, all people only think of Delhi Sultanate, uh, not India. But India is very different. And so I think what we need to learn is, again, to decompose the central numbers into regional uh, dimensions. And the fact that Tamil Nadu and Kerala are different from Madhya Pradesh and uh, Bihar has as much to do with the anti-caste movement which was going on in, uh, in South, in the Justice uh, uh, Party and so on. You know, for much of the 20th century, you know, by the time Mandal happened, Tamil Nadu was able to say, this is not good enough. We've gone far beyond all these reservations long ago. You know, there was agitation about reservation of jobs for uh, non brahmin castes in Madras province in 1920s. You know, so we have to understand that India is different, you know, and, and, the, and the, the, the hold of caste is different in, in different regions. 
uh, Gujarat has no Brahmin domination that, I, that, that one can know of. And Gujarati Brahmins are not even very Brahminical because the first uh, modern mill in cotton textile mill was founded by, by Brahmin in, in, in 1850s. Uh, so, I mean, we, we have to understand the difference. And to me, one very important dimension, since I don't have much time, I have to speak, skip from topic to topic. To me, one very important dimension of defecation and malnutrition is that we have a caste system in which basically, uh, all I can say, a shit is associated with untouchability. And therefore, we, we respectable Hindus don't want to think about what comes out of us. It is somebody else's responsibility. We do not actually want to debate it. That is somebody else's problem and the person whose problem it is to pick it up is not worth discussing. Now, if you have that attitude and if you have a, a society in which systematically treated a substantial minority of the people as less than human. Human development is a difficult problem. You know, and, and it, it's no good talking about Advaita and all that sort of stuff. Advaita doesn't matter. Untouchability does. Uh, and I think we have to be quite conscious of the fact that that... And I think the same thing happens about, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the lively topic of t today. Women's safety. I mean, in a, I, I can't even begin to get, go into uh, how misogynistic uh, Indian mythology is. Uh, I think I might be lynched if I got into any, any details of it. But it is very, very misogynistic. You know, the, the, the disfiguring of Shurpanaka by Ram and Lakshman is a shocking incident. You know, if it happened today, there would be a fast court action for defacing a woman who had done you no harm, cut her nose and ears off. You know, that, that's shocking, but not thought to be shocking. If you, if, you, if you grow up in a system in which somebody defacing a woman is not shocking behavior, how are you going to respect women? Right? And so, so we, have, we, have, we, have, we, have deep, we have deep problems here which you have to face up. Okay. Anyway. Uh, Life is uh, long and time is short. Uh, so I think one of the interesting things that the human development uh, model did was we went on in 1995 to go into the gender dimension. Uh, if, if, you, if you read the 1995 Human Development Report, uh, we developed a gender empowerment measure, GEM, and all sorts of... Uh, and I think one of the things perhaps uh, uh, the, the uh, center ought to do here as a pioneering effort, is to really have a human development index only for women in India. And what we, what we did not do, although we sort of talked about it, we talked about human security, but our notion of human security that time, I think Mabu Bulhak was, was, a, was very insistent on our human security. Our notion of human security did not actually relate to the kind of issues women are talking about today. Security in a sense of personal feeling of well-being. And when can a society generate a personal uh, uh, feeling of well-being, which may not at all be uh, independent, uh, dependent on private income, but on public infrastructure, the kind of transport you have, the kind of lighting you have, the kind of police you have, the kind of courts you have, the kind of attitude people have. Now, if we could, as it were, as a pioneering effort in the center, construct an index of uh, women's safety or women's well-being, then perhaps we would have made a good contribution to human development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lord Desai, for bringing in the issue of women's empowerment and uh, suggesting that the new center could take up the issue of HDI for women. Thank you very much for your suggestions. We will certainly uh, keep that in mind as we go along. Do we take questions? Friends, I have been informed that Professor Sen would like to answer a few questions, but 
let the questions be brief to the point and uh, keep in mind that his time is very precious and limited the floor is open there are volunteers with uh, mics about 10 minutes will be devoted to the question and answer session and uh, I request Honorable Minister Sri Jairam Ramesh to please preside over this part. Okay, short question and only Very one short. question per person. Very short. Uh, I come from the Dalit community. I wanted to ask what is the human development index if we do not measure the human development of Dalits in India? Why don't you measure? Yeah, yeah. no, I got the question. Um, well, the human development of Dalits is a very big part of the total human development picture. Human development is, of course, an aggregate picture. So here's the, here's the thing that one should understand about human development. It is concerned with how the lives are going with a collectivity of people. When we are talking about human development for India, then Dalits, non-Dalits, uh, high caste, low caste, all together, Hindus, Muslims, all together. If you want to see the deprivation of a particular group, then you do the human development uh, calculations, including the human development index for that group, which would be in this case Dalit. So one of the things to do, and what you would, if you ask the, if, if you convert the question to from one which is, uh, you know, seeking a solution, perhaps even making a critique, to one which is a, following a constructive agenda, is when you're breaking down, as they have been, there have been human development reports for all the regions of India, you could do human development for Dalits as a group. And you will get the result that would be really interesting to compare the human development of Dalit, human development of non-Dalit, or perhaps to get a bigger, sharper picture because some of the non-Dalits also are quite deprived, is to look at the relatively affluent compared with the Dalits and see how the structure is going. So the human development is a tool of analysis which applies to any collectivity and can be applied to the Dalits also. But it's a kind of thing that if, if you think it should be pursued, and I, I would agree with you that it should be, then I think it would be appropriate for research to be done on that and for these numbers to be generated. So that is the constructive implication of the interesting question you're raising. I think uh, Dr. Chibba wants to just say something on this. No, just to add that, uh, absolutely, just to say that actually there is su uh, such a calculation has been done. And in India. Uh, it is quite a revealing also. picture and we can make it available it's to you. Also. Published, yeah. Uh, Meghna, do you want to say something? No, no. I just want to say one of the things that Human Development Report did do a long time ago was to break down a, a aggregate national index into, uh, into different groups. And I remember when we, we discovered that in, in the United States, uh, the life expectancy of uh, black male population was lower than that in Bangladesh uh, at that time. So we showed how the great contrast in life expectancy, something simple like life expectancy between white male, white female, black female and, and, and black male. Yeah. And you, know, you, you begin to learn that by breaking up a collectivity into different components, it's much sharper focus on the kind of inequalities which exist in a society. And I just, to, I just one footnote to that, that the uh, particular thing about um, uh, African Americans or blacks and non-black, uh, I, I published an article on that in the Scientific American of 1992. And you can see that, and that in some ways a similar thing can be done for Dalit. I gather from Ajay that it's, uh, and, and also from Jairam that it already exists. But there are quite a lot, the picture that came out was very starkly different from the average picture for the United States. Any questions on this side? Yeah. Mike, Mike. I am Ashok Kumar from One World. Uh, my question is, uh, how does it help the cause of human development, overall human development of the country, if we look at uh, the development issues through various prisms like uh, women, uh, rural, children, Dalits, 
how does it help the cause of overall human development? Overall human total. Huh? Overall, overall, sense, overall, overall. I was thinking the word. Yeah, overall. Uh, you know, the overall is made up of these parts. So there's no way you can say that this is just overall, but not apply to any group. And I think it's therefore very important to, uh, there are three things to recognize. One, that the overall is made up of these components, therefore you couldn't be independent of the components. Second, that we are interested, as the last question uh, indicated, as to how things are going for a particular group, and especially a deprived group, which in this case could be Dalit. And, and it's similarly the question of how is it go, going for women compared with men, and so on. And the third issue is to recognize that there is a deep issue of justice involved in it. Underlying the human development approach is a belief in the theory of justice. And I try to discuss that in my book called The Idea of Justice, which was published in 2009. And you would see how the idea of justice for a group of people, of humanity at large, has to be integrally connected with the, what's happening to the lives of the people making up of the population. I also argue why it can't be just national boundaries. Uh, it, it, has to be, it has to be global in some sense. Professor Sen, would you agree to take four or five questions at one go? And I think that may be much better. And you know, we can get in, pack in a little more questions. Yes, we have the young lady here, right here. Right. Please give her the mic. I think I can okay, no, okay. No, no. no, no, no. I think we all, we all sound much louder to ourselves <laughs> than to others. Professor Sen, my name is Rita Sony. I'm with NASCOM Foundation, and a very quick question. I just was hoping you could comment on the role of technology, since we're speaking about India and how much of a difference technology has already made for India, obviously not reaching the last mile nor the last inch, but in thinking about post-2015, what the role of technology can be. Okay, there's a lady right up there in the back. Yeah, please. I'm trying to ensure maximum geographical distribution. <laughs> yes, I see that there is a kind of e spatial <laughs> equity going on. <laughs> uh, I'd like to just ask about the on the Women's Human Development Index that there's a huge difference in women face. Yeah, yeah, here, up. Oh, up there. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. Okay. See, women Don't fall down. Go back a bit. No. <laughs> Uh, women face different types of the poverty in terms of, uh, uh, say, if they are doing uh, unpaid work or if they are in employment, in decision making, in uh, holding of assets and all. So how do we actually, uh, 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 we cannot do a single uh, kind of a, uh, index for every woman on, also, can you just elaborate on that? Okay. Yes, sir, right here. So, uh, can you, can you, can, I, I don't think I... What, can you collapse everything into one index? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. Okay. Hello. I'm to bring some international flavor also. Uh, absolutely, um, you must. <laughs> can, can you discuss the uh, uh, connection between <laughs> the... <f> oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> between the future of climate change policy and uh, human development, especially in, con in regards to f how to finance them? How to finance them? in terms of climate change and human development and how they're interlinked and how you see them going forward in the future. Okay, Ravish. <laughs> so, Ravish Tiwari. Now I'm, I'm ensuring occupational diversification of the journalists. <laughs> no. uh, you uh, talked about Asian model of One development, uh, the human capability expansion model. And in another place you talked about how Europe uh, made a catastrophic error in not uh, thinking about growth. And in another place you said that in, while talking about food security, the fiscal parameters are always hurled against it. Do, so economic growth contributes to human development and it expands the economic growth potential. That's the Asian model. But sometimes growth growth might be bogged down because of the fiscal burdens. Do you think in terms of policy prescription, is, does in short term there, is, there could be trade-offs where the policy prescription can be slowed down so as to like say, food security model can be done, a, a legislative way can be done four years down the line. Can that be, 
can those trade offs be made okay uh, i'll let him handle the four questions okay <laughs> well uh, the first question was a complicated one about technology and that sort of could be a very big subject i think it comes into it almost immediately in two respects uh, that already i've touched on one is the issue of media and the nature of technology has of course changed the nature of the coverage that we can make uh, and and that's really quite important india is one of the few countries in the world in which the circulation of newspapers is still going up and going up fast so that remains despite the despite the tendency towards um, declining newspapers in europe and america uh, we stand in a way that where old fashioned media technology still remains very important but that doesn't mean that the internet is unimportant in india because all these are expanding very rapidly uh, india by the way sells more newspapers than any other country in the world and it's to our credit that we are we have a channel to which the complaints that have been been voicing could be put together both in terms of the traditional media including the newspapers as well as the new media the other way that it immediately comes up since it concerns with the lives and poverty and and deprivation of people that sometimes technological change can be a cause for unemployment at least a short run unemployment it's a question of adjustment of how you deal with it now that's a subject on which a lot has been written even i have written on a couple of papers that i did for ilo about 30 years ago and so on. indeed the book i did for them too was on that subject so i won't try to cover the ground technology enters uh, i think karl marx said in one context almost every aspect of human life and i think that is that being so it's not going to be so easy to detach us just say this is the relevance of technology it's relevant in all kinds of way and sometimes uh, perhaps you and i should chat on that subject one indicator that was my call with mabubul haq namely uh that's why i called it vulgar to try to capture a complexity of human life uh, and especially the society uh, with all the different human life in it into one indicator but they have different purposes see some we often say aggregative statement there's no way we if we say let's take the statement about bangladesh now one indicator it doesn't have to be but there's a small number of indicator that it, that shows how different things are just to give it an indication um in the course of the last 20 years we were about 40% or 60 50% richer than bangladesh now we have twice of per capita income in the same period bangladesh who had a lower life expectancy than us now has higher we have 65 they have 69 infant mortality was higher in bangladesh than in india now it's low in bangladesh our is 48 there is 38 under five mortality was higher in bangladesh in 20 years ago now it's lower 63 in 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 india 48 in bangladesh total fertility rate was much higher in bangladesh than in india that is bangladesh is now much lower and indeed almost close to um to uh, to replacement uh, access to imports and sanitation uh is dramatically higher in in bangladesh there's only about uh the 48% have no toilet the corresponding number is about 8% infant immunization is 72% in india and now 75 95% is bangladesh against the triple vaccine now i can put this together in one index too and that would be in and i am doing it implicitly when i'm saying bangladesh is doing better in all aspects or nearly all aspects of human development other than income but that is like an index but spoken in words you know maths is not very different from words because it's one way of presenting words so we could sometimes when we summarize it act it in one indicator one that is doing very well but it's made up of these components so i think the thing to recognize that one indicator is a way of making an aggregative judgment but it's not independent of the different component on the basis of which there is this lovely uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, a supply word the philosophical uh, philosophers often use is being um, being 
a function of or, 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 or super uh, based on a collectivity of, of indicators. So I think uh, I'll let you speak, Meg, now. Uh, but uh, I've been asked the question, I have to answer it. So the, so, uh, the average or the totality is also something in which we are interested. But what would be really wrong is that you said, this is one indicator, I'm not going to talk about how that indicator is higher. That would be really outrageous. Because I could say, show me why Bangladesh is doing better. Then I would do I, what I said, life expectancy, infant mortality under five, uh, total fertility rate, access to improved uh, uh, sanitation, DPT, immunization, and so on. So I think it's, both have their roles in communication. But running quickly through climate change, uh, of course I was delighted that Ajay quoted something I wrote a long time ago. Uh, but you know, uh, human development is about how people's lives are going now. And it would be a real mistake, as some people suggested, we put in something of the future in it. That would be like putting in a consumption index, future consumption. What we have to say that is not only that we want high human development, we want sustainable human development to take, the, to take that uh, way of approach which Gu Wintland made famous. She was here until yesterday, just flown back. But we all have a great deal of attitude, uh, gratitude to, to point that out. We could say a lot more, and I, indeed I spoke, speak about that in the, my book, Idea of Justice. There, there, there is quite a long section exactly on, uh, on that issue. On the uh, question about whether there is a case for short run, forgetting the welfare, uh, et cetera, uh, I don't think it really worked that way, partly because of the fact that high productivity does depend on education and healthcare. You know, China does it consistently better than us, and it's not because it cuts on welfare, it's because it does education and healthcare better than we do. And they get a bump for that. And this is the, the first lesson on that came from the Japanese in the, in the, immediately after the Meiji Restoration in 1860s. They went immediately for educational development. And from a country with uh, about half literacy, within about 40 years, they were almost complete literacy. And by 1911, they were publishing more books than any other country in the world, and twice as many as in the United States. And that has been, liber uh, that has been one of the main streams of development and growth in, in Japan. So I think it's a very much a false economy. It's exactly like the European thing to which you are referring, <laughs> namely, if you have debt, cut it now, expenditure but overlooking the fact that cutting the expenditure for Keynesian and indeed other reasons might reduce your GDP and growth rate in such a way that it doesn't help. And similarly here, by cutting your education and healthcare and sanitation, you don't improve your growth rate, you actually worsen it. That's the important thing to recognize. I think uh, Professor Sen has made just one important oh, yeah. point on sustainable human development. I just want to add one word here. That the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, are for developing countries. And there is now a debate going on in the international community about sustainable development goals. Of course, we in India think that sustainable development goals is a Western plot to keep us in a state of permanent poverty. But the fact of the matter is that the sustainable development goals will apply to all countries, whereas the MDGs apply only to the developing countries. So from an equity point of view, I think sustainable human development, India must take the leadership role. Because in, if you're not going to have sustainable development in the United States, uh, you're going to be affecting livelihoods in the other parts of the world as well. So I think we, as a country, we must get out of this mindset that looks upon sustainability as some sort of a ploy to keep us in a state of permanent backwardness, whereas we have the greatest vested interest in ensuring that the world moves to a sustainable regime because clearly there are Western economies that are on an unsustainable growth path which has implications on climate change for us particularly. I think we have time for two questions more. Mr. Lahiri, yes ma'am. I'll, I'll come to you Mr. Lahiri first here. She's the uh, WHO yeah. I'm Nata Minab, the WHO representative. Uh, Professor Sen, uh, I would like to link uh, health and human rights and refer to your statement about importance of access to healthcare. 
with universal health coverage agenda that India is trying to pursue now and with many Indias that we have inside India and with desire to prevent catastrophic health expenditure that push people further into the poverty. How can India, with its federal structure of governance, pull all the states to subscribe to this agenda and move forward the universality of health coverage? I think I'd better an answer that question separately. Okay. Uh, oh, unless you think that I should uh, take on, okay. Just take one then question more, one and then it's a then very important then, question, yeah. I think. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Lahiri? Thank you, sir. <coughs> sir, you had made a comparison between India and China. As far as China is concerned, they are going ahead of us, both in terms of human development as well as income. Bangladesh is going ahead of us in, ter in terms of certain human development indicators, but certainly not income and in perhaps not in respect of all human development indicators. Now, China and India, the, sir, the, the obviously we are lagging behind them. Though we are doing reasonably well, we are still lagging behind them. What is the reason? What are the factors? Is it the political system only simplistically? They are autocratic, we are democratic, and probably the pulls and pressures of a democracy keep us down. Or are there certain other inherent factors which are related to the psyche of the people uh, that are keeping that, that are making this difference. Okay, <laughs> I think these are two very. Large okay, questions. well, I begin with the last question. You know, I think um, this is very nostalgic for me because when I used to say that it's not the case that India's low rate of growth is connected with democracy, they all said, no, 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 India has this Hindu rate of growth, namely three percent, because I said democracy. Look at China, look at Singapore, look at Hong Kong. And, you know, it, it seemed to me completely wrong analysis. And, of course, as it happened, no one says that now, mainly because India's high rate of growth uh, and, and that of many other countries like Brazil, which right now this year is lower, but in general has been a very high rate of growth. So I think that misdiagnosis, to go for autocracy against democracy or the character of the people, but I thought I was giving an answer, namely the Chinese have been following the Asian development path which is growth with human development, not just using the resources to expand human, uh, human development, which of course China has been doing well, but right from the beginning tried to achieve development. Now, they made a lot of false steps. They, you know, I've written about that, the famine, the cultural revolution, and even after the economic reform, they didn't get the health care right for a long time. But once it steadied, uh, and then it came online to, in a way that South Korea was already doing, Japan had already done, excepting that they did it in a much bigger, much greater scale, and achieved something which no other country had. And had a pragmatism, if you want to contrast, you contrast with Russia. When Russia Soviet Union ended, they suddenly decided that they're going to change all institutions and have the market economy. And they had a completely catastrophic 1990s. And what happened was because they, all the functioning institutions they abolished at one go, and they expected new institutions to come up in the way some textbooks of economics talk about, that if there's demand, there will be supply, and if supply needs institutions, institutions will come. That's not the way how institutions come. The Chinese didn't go like that at all. They used a much more pragmatic thing by that time. They kept all the older institutions and they introduced new ones, and the new ones are growing fast, and the older institutions basically withered away in comparison. They're still often there. Sometimes people say China does so much better than the power sector than India does because it's privatized. It's not privatized in China. It's just, uh, just as in India, it is public control. The only thing is that the Chinese make a huge amount of investment in, the, in power, and, and we don't. Uh, they generate about 15% profit a year, which is mostly plowed back into the power sector to yeah. develop. We generate a loss, and that's not unconnected with all the things I was talking about, the pressure, the fertilizer, the subsidy, the, you know, the electricity uh, has to be cheaper to the domestic consumers, a uh, whole lot. I mean, this country had, every time I come, I go to a restaurant, I have to carry a full over because at an artificially lower price of electricity, we keep uh, our air conditioners at a level 
that is almost, uh, you know, inhuman. Uh, I made a comparison. The uh, Tokyo keeps everything public thing at, at 23 degrees. Uh, Hong Kong does it about 22. Thailand, Bangkok does it 22. We do it 16. And I asked a government official in one of those like, super cool rooms, I said, how do you, what do you make of that? He said, oh, I got used to it. I can manage it. Well, the why should you have to manage it? First, use a huge amount of scarce resource, subsidized by the government, if not explicitly subsidized, implicitly by allowing it to run at a loss. And then we, we go and, then, you know, we already go everywhere with a scarf and sweater and so on. I, I think the whole thinking about that has turned very unpragmatic in, in India. And the Chinese have been doing, and that came up in the context of a very interesting question that was early, asked earlier, Namely, they have been going for education, the health care, the immunization, the, the toilets, and everything. And these have been helpful for economic development rather than a hindrance to it. So there is nothing about mysterious about the Chinese achievement. And I don't think it's anything to do with autocracy. When I think China turns into a multi-party democracy, which I believe it might, and it will probably, I think you will find the growth rate unaffected by it because it really turns on the pragmatism, which we may be missing out on that. Now, on the other question, I, I'm, afraid to, I'm afraid I don't want the present model to be applied to all the states. I think it's a catastrophic model. I think the whole focus on paying people for big operations, rather than having preventive uh, attention and having regular milk, and nothing is that bad in this country, as what is called general practice in, 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 in Europe and is called internists in, in the United States. General multi, you know, we haven't got a real doctor. Now, to make, to have a system where when you have a real operation, very expensive, certainly, should be subsidized, yes. But we also want to reduce the incidence. But what happens, this, give, this producer, especially in a, super privatized healthcare. India has more privatized healthcare than any other country in the world right now, and not to mention that any other country at this stage of economic development. They have all developed, like Europe has, you can have private insurance. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, I had, when I was Master of Trinity, I was covered by National Health Service, but uh, since I, 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 I think it's, uh, if it's not unjust to have uh, luxurious travel, which I sometimes do, and, and if it's not uh, 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 impossible for the rich to have to have uh, to buy a yacht, I, I, I couldn't afford a yacht, so it wasn't a serious question for me. But the Canadian system, which doesn't allow it, it only allows private insurance, only for uh, uh, you know prescription uh, medicine and private beds, uh, and I think dental or, uh, or, or uh, I think dental care. Um, that is, I don't understand that system. So allow private, but you have to construct a public base, which is exactly what, by the way, Kerala is not a model. I've never said it's a model, but if you look at Kerala, there is this issue that they develop the public sector health care first, and now, of course, it's more than 50 percent of the healthcare come from the private sector. But because it's based on a foundation of the public sector thing, that's what we have lacked now. Also to say that medicine costs will be covered, but we don't have good doctors. That is an invitation to have super expensive medicine achieving extremely little. So I think Indian healthcare has gone completely out of gear. And uh, I think um, we ought to put that uh, in, in, uh, right, rather than say how to make this model be accepted everywhere. That would be very bad service to India. Thank you, Mr. Sen. I think that's all we have uh, time for. But a very quick comment on Mr. Lahiri's point, uh, if it end the response by Professor Sen. If you look at South Korea, sun preference in South Korea was stronger than in India and China 30 years ago. And in a 30 year time span, that same culture which had a higher sun preference today is held out as an example of a public action in which gender equality has been achieved, at least in terms of sex ratios at birth and infant mortality. And South Korea is a very good example. So these arguments about culture and nature of political systems, I think uh, historical experience shows us is, is very limited arguments.
Yeah, make that one final word. I just, when one, someone says, you know, can one index capture everything? I think it's the one thing. If the Human Development Report in 1991 had said 15 dimensions are very important, nobody would have been here today 15 years later. It was because of one number. And that one number is what the magic is all about. We all know it's imperfect, but that's what we are fighting GDP about. It's because of one number that it appeals. That's what Mahbub said. Exactly. Mahbub said it's very vulgar, but that's what I want right exactly. now. <laughs> it's an invitation to look at all the tables. Yeah. Vulgar means popular, after all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Professor Sen. Thank you very much, sir, Professor Sen, for uh, taking these questions and giving such detailed uh, uh, replies, and to the Minister for managing the equity issue so uh, no, remarkably. May I now uh, call upon Professor Peter D'Souza to uh, honor the guests and dignitaries on the dais with mementos as a token of our gratitude. Uh, we would like to, hand, to present Professor Sen uh, a book on history in the making, the visual archives of Kulwant Roy, and a book by Aung San Suu Kyi on Burma and India, some aspects of the intellectual life under colonialism, and a UNDP publication, Planting Seeds of Change, commemorating the four decades of partnership of UNDP with Government of India. I now request Professor Peter D'Souza. Yeah, he's opening it. It's rather heavy. <laughs> yes. Could you unwrap it, please? Thank you so much. But we have individual copies for each of you. May I now request Professor Peter D'Souza to present to the minister uh, Honorable Minister Jairam Ramesh, uh, a packet of books, not HDR. not HDR, is reading Gandhi in two tongues and other essays, Burma and India, some aspects of the intellectual life under colonialism by Aung San Suu Kyi, and pioneering the human development revolution, an intellectual biography of Mehbubul Haq, uh, of, by Khadija Haq and Richard Ponzio, which we thought that you would appreciate, and of course the uh, history of, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> we thought you would have less time, sir. <laughs> and may I now request Professor Peter D'Souza to present to Lord Meghnath Desai a packet of books which he thought we might find interesting. Is Diversities in the Indian Diaspora, Nature Implications and Responses, by, uh, edited by N. Jairam, and Aung San Suu Kyi's book, plus Planting Seeds of Change, the UNDP-India partnership uh, for over four decades in, con in the country. Thank you. May I request Professor Peter D'Souza to please present to uh, Dr. Ajay Chibber. Uh, recognizing Diversity, Society and Culture in the Himalaya, author uh, Dr. Chetan Singh, and Burma in India, Some Aspects of Intellectual Life Under Colonialism by Aung San Suu Kyi. Thank you, Professor Peter D'Souza. It's now my uh, privilege to request Professor Peter D'Souza, Director of the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, to propose a vote of thanks. I have to be brief, but I don't really want to give up my privilege of offering the vote of thanks. Uh, this evening we've heard uh, ideas on the history of human development, ideas on the relationship between growth and human development, and we hope that in the years to come, the new center, the International Center for Human Development, will be an institutional home for these ideas, an institutional home where research will link with policy, where institutional innovations that have been practiced in countries across the world will be available for sharing, and where... Um, there will be a, a thick conversation that will develop between countries of the global south. 
uh, we are really, uh, when, when, when UNDP was looking for an institutional partner uh, and they asked the government of India uh, to, to, to find an institutional uh, partner in India for this, the Indian Institute of Advanced Study was seen as, as a natural partner because when in 1965, uh, Dr. Sarvapali Radhakrishna imagined an institute, imagined the Institute of Advanced Study and, and, and um, uh, gifted the Rashtrapati Nivas for this imagination, he gave it the mandate to be a place where scholars could spend time to reflect on the human condition. And in that sense, uh, working with UNDP to partner this new institution seemed to be a kind of natural uh, progression. We are, we are very grateful that Professor Marthya Sen, who has been mentoring this idea for several decades, uh, has agreed to be with us to inaugurate the Institute. Uh, we are grateful not just because this has been such a part of uh, his intellectual work, but because that intellectual work, in a sense, invites us uh, to engage with this thick relationship between ethics and economics. And in that thick relationship, several key ideas have emerged. And it is these ideas that we hope the Institute will take forward in, 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 in the four areas of work that it has outlined for himself. Thank you, Professor Sen, for, for being with us today and inaugurating this Institute. We are thankful to uh, the Minister, Mr. Jairam Ramesh, not just for the energy that he brings into public debate, not just because he goes an extra mile in delivering uh, the, 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 the benefits of development, but because he has, a, he has very often in the last few months, I think taken, uh, taken the public debate, uh, invited the public de debate to engage with difficult and incon inconvenient questions. And many of, many of these questions have in a sense moved us out of our comfort zone. And I hope that in the, the, the uh, months and years to come, the Institute will be able to provide both the research uh, work and the policy work to support some of these suggestions. That Thank you very much for presiding over today's function. I'm grateful to Professor Lord Desai uh, for joining with us, not just, again, because of his long association with this idea uh, from, from, from late 18, uh, 1980s to, to, through the last two decades, uh, but also because in the last few years he has played such an important role in critiquing our public institutions. He has played an important role as a public intellectual in, in, in engaging with us on how to move forward this idea of human development. He has traveled all the way to be with us today and I'm grateful that you have uh, uh, agreed to be with us and, and comment on the debates. I'm grateful to Ajay Chibbar uh, for uh, not just steering the idea of the center through UNDP, but for, for in, in the many decades since the idea has sort of been fermenting and growing both within the, the, the policy and development community, but for arguing that such a center must come up in India. He has in fact uh, patiently and, pain and, 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 and with great uh, perseverance uh, persuaded uh, both communities that such a center must be located in India because of India's rich development experience. And I'm really grateful that you've made this long journey from New York to be with us today. Thank you. The International Center of Human Development would not really have been possible if we had not got the support of uh, the government of India. Um, Honorable Minister Sibyl supported it when he was in the ministry. Honest, uh, Honorable Minister Palam Raju has supported it. Secretary uh, Ashok uh, Thakur has been fully supportive of this idea and we have received support from senior officials of the Ministry of Education, the Ex Ministry of External Affairs, the Department of Economic Affairs, the Planning Commission and we are grateful for them because all of them have come together to make it possible that such a center can can, can um, find its place in India, but be available not just to the global south, but to the world as well. Thank you very much for all the support that you have given us. I must place on record my gratitude to the uh, um, country office of the United Nations, the resident representative who has been tirelessly supporting this idea, to the country director, to the advisors and senior staff of UNDP, as well as to the chairman and governing body of the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, who have, in a sense, worked quietly and collegially 
in making the International Center for Human Development a reality. Thank you very much. On, uh, thank you very much. I'd also like to thank my colleagues from the academic and policy community who have come here today in fraternal solidarity, who, who shared with us the excitement of this new center. And I hope that in the months and years ahead, it will be possible for all of us to draw on your expertise and to draw on your scholarship to take forward the possibilities that are inherent in this new center. I want to thank the media uh, for uh, joining us today and, and, and taking, uh, announcing to the world uh, that such an institute has now come into place. And I hope again in the years to come that you will be a partner of the new center in, in making sure that the idea of human development becomes an integral part of policy making. And lastly, let me thank the students who have come here from the different universities of the capital, from research institutes across uh, the, the, the national capital region. The future belongs to you. And we hope that in the years to come, the International Center for Human Development will be your ally in making this future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor D'Souza, uh, for uh, proposing the vote of thanks. Friends, we come to the end of today's program, but as has been reiterated just now, it is the beginning of our partnership with each one of you. We sincerely thank each one of you for taking time to come here. And may I say that this intellectual feast that we have had today would be matched, I hope, with a real feast for no celebration in India is complete without food. And it's part of our celebratory uh, custom. So there is high tea waiting for you in the basement. In uh, mindful of the uh, cold weather outside, we prefer to put it in the basement. My colleagues will be there to take you to the uh, basement. Please do join us so that there is more time for interaction. And uh, we'll see you at tea. Thank you so much once again.